Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining us for the seventh and final season or series of our our run through the Buffalo Bills draft class. And that today I am joined by special guest Christian Page. Once again, going to walk through our seventh and final pick, Dane Jackson, the cornerback out of Pittsburgh, as well as some of our uh, undrafted free agent class that came through. Christian, how are we doing? I'm doing good. What, what since the draft's come and gone? What's the quote that says, you know, smile because it happened, or don't cry because it's over? However, that is that. That's kind of <laughs> how I feel every year uh, after Saturday. It's like, well, especially I can't take it for granted at this moment because, like we said earlier, you know, uh, you can't take any sporting live sporting event for granted. But that's definitely always something fun to recap. Yeah, it's it's crazy, and especially you know, someone like yourself, and again, Russell, you know, uh, Eric, Zach, uh, Brad, the the whole group over Cover One dot net. You so many guys doing this. You guys pour so much time and effort into your rankings, your, your draft guides, all the different grades that you go through, all the different film that you watch. And it's all built on that that culmination of the draft and who's going to get picked where and making fun of who reached on a guy and who is a great value. And, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this guy's available in the seventh round or I can't believe this guy went undrafted. And it's just such a whirlwind of three days and that everything comes together and you guys work for months and months and months, a year, a whole year on this event. And boom, three days, it's done. And now we're, you know, you get into, okay, 364 days is coming back around. Uh, So I think today is an interesting one to get into in that, um, you know, there there can still be some gems in the seventh round. I think Brandon Bean talked about in his uh, post-draft presser about that this is where you get into, um, you know, there is a best player available element, but you're also looking at who has a chance to make the roster, who's got their best – avenue to be able to fight for a spot here um i think the stats show that seventh round picks are are barely over 50 percent to be able to make rosters so i think a lot of times those are guys that don't always make the cut here uh the bills went with uh one of the few uh full seniors that they went through many of the guys that they were bringing in uh were or actually more than the normal amount of early de- uh, declarations here. Uh, but I know Jackson was the guy that you and I got to see down in Mobile, uh, Alabama, the Senior Bowl. Uh, why don't you give a little, just a high-level overview of what you saw from Dane Jackson and what Bill Spence can expect? Yeah, piggybacking off of the Senior Bowl performance, he was a guy that I didn't have much intel coming into the week, but he definitely flashed. And, and you saw him just play with that aggressive mentality, and that definitely correlates to his film. You know, he's six foot. Uh, 187 pounds and so he uh, he he packs a punch in my opinion maybe pigeonholed more as that nickel guy um, but definitely packs a punch and he's gonna let you know he's there Uh, that and that's something you really want to see in a cornerback and we talked about maybe the mentality of an AJ Epinesa in our first show Dane Jackson seems to carry that same weight uh, when he's playing the game and so uh, he has that that mentality to go get the football he has that click and close ability that you really like to see and He's, he's not going to shy away from contact. You know, he's going to be effective as a perimeter tackler as well in the run game, um, but he definitely has that that route recognition or that overall instincts to, to kind of function or, or carry over on the, the development of the play. But he has that athleticism in his lower half to definitely, you know, build on that, to actually react and make a play on the ball. And uh, he was a dominant high school basketball player. I think he averaged nearly – 30 points a game at the high school level. And so he definitely has a fun highlight tape. And you can see a lot of that athleticism come to fruition that he also brings to the football field. No, that's interesting. I don't think I was aware that I'm going to have to go go search for that after we, we wrap up here. Um, you know, you talked about it here, six foot, 187. Um, I think played around 190. Um, decent arm length, but a little bit on the lower side here. So, again, you're talking about a seventh round prospect. So there's not going to be uh, a flawless athletic profile here. So, you know, I say average to below average in most of the measurables. Um, you see that in some of the comps, although I thought it was interesting that one of the tops was Damon Arnett. Uh, was another guy where, again, that when you're looking for comps in the Bills system, it's going to be, you know, recognition skills, willingness to tackle, inter- you know, the willingness to come up and be competitive to, you know, if Eric likes to say, fire your gun and be able to, you know, get, get yourself up in there to, to, 
stay sound in the run game, but also recognize what's going on and come up and make sure tackles quickly on those crossers, on those bubble screens, on those short hitches that, you know, you can keep those at the five and six yard gains and not be able to let it get ahead of you. So it's encouraging to hear that he's willing to do that. Um, and again, one of the few guys who actually did red shirt and then play all four, all four years. So coming in a touch older than some of the other guys in the class, a little bit more mature, uh, ready to be able to come in and compete. And I know cornerback was an area that Bills fans were very torn on. There were some who were adamant that it was a, a primary need, maybe even number one need, uh, with obviously Levi Wallace coming back, the signings of Josh Norman and EJ Gaines. Obviously, there's a fair amount of talent in that area, but you know, does Josh Norman have anything left in the tank? Can EJ Gaines um, stay healthy beyond – what we've seen the last couple of years where he hasn't been able to stay on the field. Is there anything left in the upside of Levi Wallace or have we seen his ceiling? And that, you know, some people were hoping to see, as you saw the Christian Fultons of the world fall, the Bryce Halls of the world fall, people wanting to come in and, and jump in and, and be able to snag a player like that. Um, with a guy like Dane Jackson and, and what you saw there is – that the kind of player that you think could develop into a contributing player, whether that be pushing Taron Johnson for a nickel role, developing while you see maybe a season behind the EJ Gaines, Levi Wallace, you know, Josh Norman triumvirate, they're battling for the RB, uh, CB2 opposite Trey White, and that maybe you have something in 2021. What What is a, a maybe a positive outlook on his upside long term? Yeah, I, I really think so. And you talked about the statistics and the success rate of those seventh round picks. I think he would be. Um, the odds would be in his favor because I think he is a guy that had some, you know, maybe top five round entry given, you know, we talked about scheme fit in our earlier show. And I think if Jackson can find a role where he can play that kind of not necessarily that alpha male type mentality on the back end in that secondary, but find a role where he can win in those physical situations, you know, maybe that is a third and short, you know, maybe, or maybe like a third and six, third and seven, the, the, the offense has to get to the sticks and he's a guy that you want on your front line in that regard. So um, you know, going to, you know, just talking about your question and just can he learn under guys that are already in the system? I think so. And I, I don't have the knowledge the, of their contract situation, but maybe he is somebody that they could be or that he could be groomed into uh, maybe a contributor day one. Um, and then, you know, I think you'll probably see a lot of his athletic traits, a lot of his physical attributes in, on special teams, because I think he could probably not necessarily be a gunner, but maybe on kickoffs and, and some punt coverage situations you're going to see some of that athleticism and then you'll get maybe you know halfway through the year you'll start to see him on the field a little more not necessarily crucial situations but some situations you didn't see him maybe weeks one through eight so uh, I think Jackson has that that physical intrigue and just that mentality to make a roster spot and to be a contributor may not early on but maybe in that second part of the field or second part of the season just uh just depending on how the season goes as a whole. Well, and I think honestly, that's as much as you can ask for a seventh round pick is that, you know, you want a guy who has a shot to be able to make the roster. You want a guy that obviously you're ideally looking for a special teams contributor and that long term, there's some upside in development that he can turn into a rotational player, a development, developmental player long term. And that, you know, simply having him on a four year rookie contract, if you get a guy who can be a serviceable backup and a guy who can rotate in and can push Taron Johnson, he can push for uh, that guy. And even if he turns into a long term CB4, that he's just that guy who backs up Trey White and whoever the other corner is has a versatility to play behind the nickel and is just your fourth guy that can step into any of the three roles whenever it's called upon. Um, that has value in today's NFL to be able to have that guy, whether it's in a dime set, whether it's an injury replacement, whether it's just ready to go while he's contributing to special teams. Uh, I think being able to see that kind of upside matters. So um, I think it's interesting to be able to add a piece like that. I certainly was was one of the people that wouldn't have minded seeing a cornerback go earlier. I was certainly pounding the table to um, to move up for a Christian Fulton as he was falling to be able to snag him. I'm, I'm happy with the Epinesa pick that I was excited about that opportunity. Um, I'm still a little confused about the Bryce Hall fall. And that obviously I have to assume that that was more on the medical side than what we had access to, because I think pretty universally seeing him as a late fifth rounder was 
was really surprising to be able to see and that, um, you know, I, I would have loved to be able to had a chance to, to be able to snag a player like that there, but um, now still getting a guy like Dane Jackson this late, I think there's a, a decent argument to be made that that was good value uh, in the seventh round. And that if you get a guy who has a chance to, to stick on the roster and have a contribution, that's as much as you can ask that, that late in the draft. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And going just quickly on the Bryce Hall situation, I guess that was the case. And I wasn't super high on him overall as a prospect, but like you said, falling to that point late in the fifth round and you maybe would the expectation of him going in that top four, even, even late day two, I think was definitely in the conversation because his film before he broke his leg and his film back in 2018 was pretty solid overall. There were some things I think he needed to work on and clean technically, but um, yeah, that's just, that's just the draft in general. And yeah. I know we're about to talk about another guy that same situation, you know, he, he, uh, Trey Adams, the, the tackle out of Washington, had a lot of upside coming into the year and just years past, but the injury bug caught up to him and now he's an undrafted free agent. Yeah, that's a perfect segue. So uh, for this seventh and final show of this series, uh, we're going to do Dane Jackson as well as our, our undrafted free agent class. Uh, I'm going to share a few of the names here, and then we'll we'll end on on Mr. Adams. I think he's certainly the name that uh, most fans are going to be familiar with, with uh, the overall group. So uh, we'll run through here. Our friends over at buffalorumblings.com always do an awesome job being able to track um, the UDFAs that have signed so far. So um, Reggie Gilliam is a name I want Bills fans to to keep their eye on because he is a possibility to be the long-term Patrick DeMarco replacement. I don't anticipate that being 2020, uh, but he's a guy who is a special teams monster, uh, blocked four kicks in the past year, uh, plays fullback, H-back, move tight end, um, has some ability here. And there's a couple guys that read and said that they think he has some Matthew Slater special teams ability and a guy that can simply carve out a long-term career as a special teamer. They were actually writing it, assuming that they they were doing it from the angle that this is the exact kind of guy Bruce uh, Bill Belichick likes to draft and that is going to you know carve out a long career in the NFL. So I'm excited about having him there. He's uh, someone I'm going to be really targeting to sneak onto the practice squad and that as Patrick DeMarco's contract expires here, I think he's the kind of guy that you look to be able to add that can be that move tight end, fullback, H-back, uh, special teams guy. Um, another name on here uh, is for anyone who doesn't know, Christian also is a, an enormous Auburn fan and, and hosts a, a show uh, of his own from an Auburn angle. So uh, what do we have here in uh, Markel Harrell? Yeah, he's a multi-year starter at Auburn, and I don't want to say there's a, a lot of promise here. I mean, he's still probably on the outside looking in as far as making the spot, but uh, or making the roster, I should say. But uh, overall, he was a pretty consistent piece at Auburn. You saw him used a lot in Auburn's zone blocking scheme. He would, uh, he was, he, I want to say he was pretty nimble with his feet, but it was never, he was never much of a liability. Um, I think you saw he was pretty clean in pass protection. There wasn't a tremendous amount of pressure coming from his spot. Um, but he was a pretty good puller out in space. You saw him make a lot of um, uh, accurate targets at the second level. Um, so I still think he's on the outside looking in. But given Auburn's heavy rushing offense, uh, I think he would be kind of a, a situational guy that you could see put in Buffalo's situation, you know, given maybe some of those zone concepts, which I know Buffalo likes to incorporate at times in their in their pass – or excuse me, in the run blocking scheme. But – Harrell, he's definitely another body that I don't think should necessarily be taken for granted out of this free agent class. Um, but I still think he's on the outside looking in, but should be a pretty uh, good camp body. And I'll just go with that. Uh, and I think that's, that's the majority of what you're looking for here. I know a few people who are excited about Josh Thomas and a guy, again, that's probably more on the special team side of things, but I think has some potential there and is, again, going to be an active camp body that's going to push people. Uh, probably more so if we saw some step back or decline or injury from a Dean Marlowe or a Saran Neal, maybe he'd get uh, an opportunity there. Same idea with Ike Brown. I think you're talking about more of a – um, a low-end camp body from a uh, coverage standpoint. Um, Antonio Williams is a name some people might recognize watching some ACC ball, uh, seeing a running back from North Carolina. Uh, again, Garrett Taylor, again, maybe some special teams opportunity uh, coming out of Penn State. Uh, Brandon Walton, another, uh, you know, I, I think camp body, but uh, a big guy. Uh, coming in out of FAU uh, for, from an offensive line standpoint. And then the one that most people are going to be familiar with um, 
is just a an incredible fall from grace uh, with offensive lineman Trey Adams out of Washington. If you go back, you know, let's go back two years from today, and that you're talking about when they do the silly, you know, future mock drafts the day after the draft just ended. He was a guy that I'm not exaggerating. I think Todd McShay had a has a top five pick coming out of that. Uh, let's say that was probably coming out of the 2018 draft that if he was to declare early after this was coming off his sophomore season at Washington um, and that he was a guy that, hey, this is your prototypical left tackle. This is your future, you know, Tony Baselli kind of player. And that, you know, to see from two years, one, that he wasn't able to declare to even go out of the draft, plays two more seasons at Washington goes all the way from the point of, hey, maybe he's a, you know, maybe that was never realistic, but it's a top five pick at that point to, I think, pretty universally a, a top day two pick, a, you know, top three round pick that was going to be there all the way to when the, you know, rubber hit the road that he went undrafted, you know, at, tell the people a little bit about what what we're walking into here with Trey Adams. Yeah, there's actually a good piece breaking down his injury on cover1.net, so you can check that out at some point, um, just doing some of your research. But, yeah, it, it was a very – I don't want to say dramatic situation because I don't want that to be, a, you know, painting him in a, bad, in a bad light. But just given some of his knee injury issues, um, he had an ACL injury, and then he also had a back issue, which was the, the injury I think you were talking about. He entered the 2018 season as one of those high-profile guys, even with some injury background already. Um, but I remember I was actually going to the kickoff game between Auburn and Washington in uh, the Mercedes Dome in Atlanta, and I think it was maybe just a day or two before, it's like, well, Trey Adams isn't going to play in this game. And, oh, yeah, he has an injured back that's going to keep him out for at least a certain amount of time, if not the whole season. So it was definitely shocking from that perspective because it was such a late injury coming about. And so, But it seems like, you know, he recovered well. It seems like all the rehabilitation process is – He's done fine in that regard, but definitely just, I will say a fall from glory, but just given, you know, expectation, it was definitely surprising um, just seeing how Adams went from, like you said, potentially a game changer at left tackle to now maybe making a roster. Um, but I think yeah. def definitely the odds are in his favor of at least making a roster. It may not necessarily be Buffalo, but I think he has that physical intrigue to, of course, make and stick on a roster, at least as a depth piece. Yeah. And so he's the kind of guy that my, you know, absolute preference is going to be the bills, you know, invested a ton of money into this health and wellness center, their coach, uh, that we got the strength and conditioning coach of the year award, um, what they've been able to do rehabbing what they've been able to do from a maintenance standpoint. You saw these this crazy laundry list of surgeries the guys ended up having after the season where all of them was like, wow, they, he was playing that whole year. You know, John Feliciano played with the torn labrum. Um, Jerry Hughes had torn tendons in his wrist and needed a um, the – you know, core muscle surgery and just multiple different things like that, that they were able to maintain, keep guys healthy and playable at a, at a healthy level. Um, that's exactly what you want here is that you have a guy like Bobby Johnson who can come in, has worked with, you know, big guys like your Cody Fords and, and John Feliciano, Quentin Spain, who are not athletic marvels uh, from that standpoint, but has been able to, to produce great results with guys like that Dan Dawkins, even, um, you know, so a year in a high end NFL strength and conditioning program with state of the art facilities with exceptional rehab programs. Let's see what we can do with just a full year focusing on his body, getting him right. And that, you know, ideally, you're able to sneak him on the practice squad for, for the year. And that I think that's your best case scenario. I I don't think he's a guy that I'm all that interested in sneaking as the ninth offensive lineman. But again, if he has a great camp and you don't think you can afford to hide him, um, I think that it's intriguing to get a guy, 
who's a UDFA that has that one time potential like that, that that's the exact kind of guy who's worth a flyer on to be able to take a stab at. So uh, my ideal scenario is that they're able to use our award winning facilities, our great strength and conditioning coach and program, um, give him a full year just to focus on his body, focus on his health, get him right. And then take a run at that at 2021 that, you know, we're talking about, Ty and Secchi's deal will be up. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, Daryl Williams deal is a one year deal. Is Cody Ford still going to be a right tackle? Is he ready to move to guard? John Feliciano's deal is up. Spencer Long's deal is up. Um, that would be awesome. If you have a guy that your worst case scenario, maybe he's that swing tackle from Ty and Secchi. Um, but best case scenario, maybe he steps in a right tackle and Cody Ford's ready to be right guard and you have your right side going forward. So, um, you know, I don't want to get fans hopes up. He went undrafted for a reason. Uh, there are some very obvious, very legitimate medical red flags that he may never be. It's, I won't even say may never. It's most likely he will never be what that initial potential was. Um, but it's still exciting to be able to take a stab at what was at one time a, a very high end prospect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, we can break down just a little bit of what he brings to the table, but overall I think his technique is pretty clean. You know, he has a balance, uh, balance pass pro. And I think as long as he can keep everything in front of him, I know that's the ultimate goal, but again, you know, that's not always reality when it comes to blocking, especially, some of the caliber of the edge rushers in the league. But if he keeps everything in front of him, he has enough length there. He has enough power in his hands. Um, but if he has to play catch up, that may be where he he has a little bit of difficulty. But overall, you're getting a pretty technical guy. And, and I think just, you know, those injury red flags is, is the reason why he went undrafted. And like you said, you know, knee injuries, you're seeing the recovery time. It's not as bad as it used to be. But Anytime you talk about a back injury, that's what scares a lot of front office yeah. personnel, and, and it should because it's something that doesn't necessarily ever go away, and you have to just expect not necessarily chronic issues, but maybe long-term issues. And I, I hate to, to point that out about Adams, but he, he knows it. It's not something that he's dismissed, and you have to own it, go forward, and, and maybe this is kind of a, a possibility of rejuvenating his, his football career. So uh, Adams still brings just a lot of physical intrigue, but if – Hopefully he gets the clean bill of health and maybe he can be quite the surprise for the 2020 draft. No, I appreciate that. And I think that it's a good way to look at it that, you know, give a guy an opportunity, see what he's got, put all your resources you have into it, and maybe you're able to rekindle that. And I think he he certainly knows that as well. There's no personal judgment in why he didn't get drafted. I think that, um, you know, it's simply a matter of, of health and availability and that if he's able to, to get that, maybe we stumble onto something fun here. So, um, as we get ready to wrap up here, uh, appreciate your time. Appreciate Russell's time being able to dive in and go through this many uh, picks for the Bills. We, we went seven picks deep as well as the UDFA class and everything that, that we put into here. Um, just to give fans listening a, a preview, what I'm going to be going into next is uh, one show each week. I'm going to do a deep dive into each position group. Um, we're going to do that from a new addition standpoint, losses that came in, where I see the pecking order ranking – depth chart uh, falling out um, what our contract status is where we're going to be going forward where you can see some of those opportunities where I see some battles for starting spots where I see some battles for a roster spot uh, who some potential practice squad eligible guys may be that we want to go after and who could be Brandon Bean's uh, you know cut down day trade target uh, you know intrigued that he'll dangle out there to try to recoup some of those draft picks so um, just something to look forward to we'll do one of those each week going forward here as we uh, work our way together through the off season um, make sure that if you're uh, listening to this you should also be listening to the cover one draft show uh, the that podcast is fantastic with Christian with Russell they're going to be going through a lot of other things here from a you know, draft fit standpoint, wrap ups on the overall draft class, and then getting you ready for the 2021 draft and who to watch out for uh, as we go into this upcoming college season and see what we're going to have from that standpoint. So uh, Christian, where can the people find you and anything else you have going on? Yeah. Uh, underscore Christian page on Twitter. And even though we may not have all this 2020 or even 2021 NFL draft content coming at cover one.net, always hit us up on Twitter, always find us in the Slack channel. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions, even if you just want to be fun, even if it's just a comment or a hot take, I'm always open to any type of conversation. 
We love talking football. That's why we do this every week. Absolutely. And I, I can confirm Christian is a good follow. He's a good time on Twitter. Make sure you're checking him out here. Thank you for everybody here working through the draft class. We'll be looking forward to all the other, other things coming up this offseason. You have been listening to Cover One Buffalo, and we are out.